All right, today we want to uh, pull all the information we can off of a stress strain curve. And so, we're looking, we have stress here in KSI and we have percent strain. Remember, percent strain is a unit. So, before we use it in calculations, we'll have to convert that to. <coughs> to uh, regular strain or just a strain no, which has no unit. So start with these are the things we want to find. Modulus, yield strength, ultimate tensile strength, strain at failure, plastic strain at failure, and the total worker fracture. So modulus, Young's modulus will be the slope of the initial linear portion of the curve. And so let's put our straight edge to this. You want to run it out as far as you can. And that gets us out to uh, 130 KSI. And as we come down, looks like we're uh, looking at about 7.5%. Um, so my coordinates here would be 7.5%, 130 KSI, if you want to know the coordinates of the point. So modulus is going to be the stress, 130 times 10 to the 3 and then converts percent strain to strain 0.075 and that gives us a value of about 1.7 times 10 to the 6th PSI or you could write if you left this as 130 and left the KSI and KSI rather than putting the 10 to the 3 PSI um, that would be 1700 KSI either of those is acceptable so 1.7 times 10 to the 6th PSI. All right, yield strength. Remember, yield strength is a uh, is arbitrarily specified to be uh, to have occurred. Yield is a, uh, specified to have been occurred when we have about 0.2 percent strain, a uh, permanent strain. So 0 0.5. I'm no, sorry, 1, 0.5, and 0.2 is really close to the uh, modulus line. And in fact, this is common in a real stress strain curve on. The universal testing machine, the offset line is going to be very close to the uh, stress strain curve. And so reading across, looks like that's right at about 99 or 100 KSI. Okay, So we'll round that to 100 KSI. My ultimate tensile strength will be the stress that causes necking to, uh, in tension. And so that looks to be uh, in the order of uh, 118 or so, 117, we'll say 118 KSI. And then uh, total strain at failure, we're just reading how much did it stretch total when it broke. And it puts us here. So we're talking 27. Looks like 27.9. It's a pretty large scale there. So 27.9 percent, or you could write that as 0.279 strain if you wish. Now the plastic strain at failure. This asks the question, or answers the question: What would happen if we were to run the test and right before fracture we were to stop the test and unload the specimen without breaking it? And in unloading, we would recover all of the elastic strain and we'd be left with only the plastic strain. Well, we're going to do that graphically by um, setting our straight edge the modulus line. I'm going to just slide it horizontally. Hopefully, don't twist it any. And what we should get is that this slope, this line should be the same as the slope of the offset line, which is also the same as the slope of the initial linear portion. Those all should be same slopes. And so that says, that tells us we've got about uh, 22.7, 22.6 or so, 0.7%, which would be a strain of 0.227. All right. So that's pretty straightforward. The last one is the work of fracture. Now, the work of fracture can be directly determined by counting the squares. If you have your data in a uh, spreadsheet is pretty easy to um, to do a numerical integration. Uh, lacking that kind of information and not wanting to count squares, a, a decent approximation will be to uh, multiply the averages or the average of the ultimate and tensile strength 
times the strain to failure. Okay, so when we do that, my ultimate was uh, 118, and my yield was 100, and my strain to failure was 27.9, but let's make that 0.279. It needs to be in terms of strain, and that gives us then a value of 30.4. Kip something, and we need to talk about what this is. Um, the answer is actually kip inches per cubic inch. Now, how does that happen? Well, we're finding an area of stress versus strain. Okay, so your going your your result is going to be the product of units of stress times units of strain. Well, strain doesn't have units, does it? Well, it does. So what you have is KSI times inches per inch. Now if we regroup or if we split that out, then that would be pounds, thousands of pounds, right, per square inch times inches per inch. Oh, if I group my numerator terms and my denominator terms, that becomes inch pounds times 10 to the 3 over cubic inches. That is work in inch pounds per unit volume of material. So this is a specific value. If we had done this on the load displacement curve, it would have just been the total work. But because we're doing it on the stress strain curve, this is the specific work per unit volume of material. And it's going to be kip inches, thousands of pounds per inch cubed. Okay, and so that's pretty much what we can pull out of a stress strain curve.